we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the word of God is not some empty entity. Word of God is very powerful because God has filled the word with the power of faith. When peace like a river attended my way when so Hebrews chapter 11, let me read to you first three verses. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Faith is spoken of in the scriptures many times as a power or as a force. And this power or a force, this creative force and power is stored up in the word of God, it seems like. Because by his word, he created everything that we see. Verse 3 says, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the word of God is not some empty entity. Word of God is very powerful because God has filled the word with the power of faith. So the word of God is powerful. It's that's like a missile I told you, you know, that's loaded with explosive power, targeted uh, to a particular spot, sometimes 1,500 miles away, 2,000 miles away. It, it travels that distance and then hits the target and destroys everything there. That explosive power is loaded into it. Faith is like that, except this is a positive power. It is loaded into the word of God, which is like a missile. When God speaks it and sends it, God says it will never return to me void. That means this missile never fails. When it goes, it goes to the particular, whatever it is speaking to, whatever situation it is addressing, it goes to it and gets the job done, never returns void unto me, he says. So the word of God is filled with faith power, 
And that is how the world was created through the word of God. And I showed you something else about the word. The word is like a seed. And uh, so you can sow the seed of God's word. If you want more faith, you begin to sow the seed of God's word. God's word has faith in it. So if you sow it, you get more of it. That's why when disciples came and asked Jesus, increase our faith, his answer was very strange to some people, but I understand it. His answer is this. He said, if you have faith like a seed, he says, say to this mulberry tree, be thou uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it will obey it, he says. In other words, what he's saying is this. You want more faith? You think this is a big problem? They had a problem forgiving. He said, you must forgive 70 times a day. That's difficult for anybody, you know. So they said, give us more faith. Tell us how to get more faith. He said, no problem. What you do is see your faith as a seed. Your faith is in the form of a seed. What kind of seed form? He says, say to this mulberry tree. So faith is in the form of words. It is stored up in words, in the words that we, we speak. Say to this mulberry tree. He's not talking about a tree. Tree doesn't matter. He's talking about the situation and what you want to happen to the situation. He says, if you have faith, then use it like a seed. Speak to that situation. Address that situation and speak to it what you want to happen. And when you're speaking, you're speaking God's word, not just your word. It's in your mouth. The mouth is yours. The word is God's. Therefore, God's word can do whatever it says. It's not that you have said it. It's that God has said it and that you lend your mouth to it. That's all. So when you speak it, he says, what happens is, it may be little, but when you keep on speaking it, when you keep speaking to your problem and declaring what must be done to the problem, then one day you'll find that the problem just takes off and does what you tell it to do. It is uprooted and planted in the middle of the sea. That's what will happen, he says. So I want to just continue and give you three illustrations today, hopefully, of uh, this very same thing, that faith cometh by hearing. See, you come and hear in the church just once a week, or maybe if you come on Tuesdays, it's twice a week, maybe two hours. Faith doesn't come because you heard on Sunday. Faith comes because you constantly keep hearing. While you hear just one or two hours a week from the church, which is good because it gives you understanding, what really brings faith is not what you hear in the church. It's what you hear every day, you speaking. <laughs> faith comes by hearing. What you are speaking. See, this is, we have taught people to come to church. So they carry their Bible, come to church once a week. And many people find that coming to church, nothing is happening. You know. They've come to church. They say, what more do you want me to do? I'm coming to church. Well, there is more to do. You see... It's not just Christian life. It's not about just coming to church. It's about living by faith. So what you must live by from Monday to Saturday is by the word also, not just hearing the word Sunday morning. Sunday morning gives you understanding. But Monday to Saturday, you got to take that word and put it in your mouth. Sunday morning, the preacher has the word in his mouth. And what you do is you hear it and you go home and you have something else in your mouth. So Monday to Saturday, you're speaking whatever you want to. You speak your hopelessness, you speak your weakness, you speak your sickness, you speak your poverty, you speak all the negative stuff because you think this is not going to matter. Preacher preaches wonderfully, you know, on Sunday morning. He's preaching faith. He's preaching positive. Who am I? I'm just talking the reality at home, you know. So you just talk whatever you want to and you think uh, that is going to get something done because you're going to go, go to church on Sunday, every Sunday regularly. See, we have taught people to go to Sunday. We have not told them how to use their mouth from Monday to Saturday. Unless we use our mouth right Monday to Saturday, going to Sunday is not going to help. Sunday will, will really help if you will take the word that was preached and put it in your mouth. And when that word, that hope, that faith that you heard, that hope that you heard, that promise that you heard, the word of God that you heard, that was in the preacher's mouth that he was expounding upon, becomes word in your mouth and in your heart. Then only it will produce result. That is why Romans 10, 8 is so important. We read it last week. He says, what saith it? That means, what does faith say? 
It says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. What does it mean? He says, you want to get saved? The subject there is salvation. You want to get saved? You don't, go up, you don't have to go up to heaven, go down to hell. You don't have to do any of these gymnastics. You don't have to cry. You don't have to roll. You, got, don't, you don't have to do anything. You want to get saved? This big thing called salvation happens very simply. The word is nigh thee, near you, in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith which we preach. In other words, he's saying, you want to get salvation? Whatever I preached is called the word of faith, Paul says, and that word is near you. It's not enough that I preached it. You take it in your mouth and you speak it now. Confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved, he says. So we preach the word of faith and you take the word of faith and put that in your mouth and you begin to speak it. Monday to Saturday, you speak in line. Not, I'm not talking about simply just saying what the word says, you know, in the sense of just memorizing it and saying it. That's not the point. What I'm saying is whatever you say, let it be in line with what God says. So if the Bible says, I shall not want, don't be talking wants. Don't talk as if you have many wants and, 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 uh, and, and that your needs are not met because the Bible says you shall not want. Declare that you shall not want. That's what I'm talking about, you know. This is the way I did not know how to relate it, you know. I told you I was sitting in a meeting and the preacher said, I'll never ever be broke even one day in my life. I thought he's the most arrogant preacher, you know. And I'd gone very newly from India and I'm sitting in this meeting, you know, in a foreign country, and this man, you know, hot shot, you know, preacher, he's saying, I'll never ever be broke even one day in my life. I thought, boy, he's got some nerve, you know. He's very arrogant. How can you say something like that? Because in our country, they taught me, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, boy, you know. <laughs> so I thought he's very arrogant. He came back after the, uh, after the session was over. He went, we went out for a break, came back again, we sat. And he said, I know some of you think I'm arrogant because I said I'll never ever be broke even one day in my life. I said, my God, who told him, you know? <laughs> See, God is telling him all this. <laughs> even when I'm preaching, some people say, you know, I come with a question, exactly you're talking about that. How was that? I said, I don't know. I don't know what the question was in your heart. So I have a doubt and I have a problem. I come with all these things. And exactly, well, the other day somebody told me, my husband and I, we speak about something in our home, we're discussing exactly the same words you're using. No, I didn't overhear you. <laughs> God does that. So he got up and said, yes, I said, I'll never ever be broke even one day in my life. And that is in the Bible. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And I said, where is in the Bible? I've never read it. I've read the Bible quite well. He said it's in Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Texas translation says, I'll never ever be broke even one day in my life. Uh, you know. <laughs> See, this is the way, this is the way you should speak. The, you, this is the way you should speak in line with the word. He's not saying the Lord is my shepherd, I shall. No, that a lot of Christians are saying. But they are not relating it to their situation. In the midst of their situation, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, when all the demons are up and working, you know, when all the situations are against you, that is when you got to pull up the word and speak the word of God related to your problem and relate it directly to your problem and declare what God says about that problem. That's the way you need to speak. Now, so let's go, let's go and look at three wonderful examples from the scriptures about uh, the word being in your mouth and in your heart. Then only it'll work. Not just in the preacher's mouth, not in the Bible. That's not enough. It's good it's there. It's good the preacher is preaching it. But ultimately, this is all done. You're reading the Bible, your Bible is in your house and, and you're coming to church and hearing the preacher. All of that is happening. Ultimately, to put the word in your mouth and in your heart, only then it will work. That final step, it doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, nothing happens. All right? First example, let's go to Genesis chapter 7. The word in the heart, in the mouth and in the heart. Examples. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, note the age now. 99 years old. Now, that's a grand old age. 
the lord appeared to abraham and said to abraham i'm almighty god walk before me and not be blameless well that's fine and then he says i will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly then abraham fell on his face and god talked with him saying as for me behold my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations this man doesn't have a child doesn't have any children this you shall be father of many nations no longer shall your name be called abram but your name shall be abraham for i have made you a father of many nations i will make you exceedingly fruitful i'll make all nations i'll make nations of you the kings shall come from you so at 99 years of age god comes and promises the impossible now now the promise is very difficult to believe because all evidences are contrary wife is 90 at least if she is young it's okay she is also 90 he is 99 things are looking bad the whole world is saying abraham just give up it's not going to happen don't just hoping don't don't just keep hoping that something's not going to happen to you it just can't happen it won't happen forget about it just go on with your life it sounds nice because it sounds reasonable it is impossible it looks like but god comes and says no 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 i'm going to multiply you exceedingly not just ordinary exceedingly i'm going to multiply and even kings are going to come up come of from you in fact i'm going to even change your name so you will be hereafter called the father of many nations the name abraham just one letter is added h is added abraham the, the, the one letter addition makes a big difference now we don't preach nameology god changed his name because it meant something and that is that is he is the father of many nations and uh, but change not just change his name because the name is going to do something no because he was hoping that this guy is going to start saying this that he is the father of many nations every time he spoke his name he said father of many nations when he, whenever he said abraham what he heard actually was the father of many nations every anybody any time somebody called abraham called him abraham the, what he heard was father of many nations now he had a whole lot of people around him living around him the bible says he had 318 people uh, that went to war with him the guys that were working for him uh, picked up their weapons and went to war against five kings and beat five kings and their armies just abraham's employees he had 318 people uh, fit for war so from that one scholar calculates how many people he had working i mean living uh, with him and working his household consisting of his servants and employees he says there must have been at least 2000 people that were living around him totally different picture of abraham some people say abraham lived in tents he didn't have a house land nothing he lived in a hut so we must also live like that you know well one fellow say one one bible scholar says he had a tent with 20 rooms a 20 bedroom tent that's a different tent my friend <laughs> if he had air conditioning those days he would have put it up you know it was a different kind of tent 20 bedroom with so many tents around him entire town working for him that type of abraham the bible talks about not the dirty bed sheet abraham you know <laughs> <laughs> the picture totally changes when you read the bible 2000 people why i said 2000 people is because you know just think about what the impact will be the name change impact 2000 people now using his name everybody before that used to talk around you know and they say well abram oh he is the guy that 99 year old guy's wife is 90 you know he's hoping to have a child and nothing's happening and he just going to forget it you know it's f- gone far beyond and that's the way they were talking now god not only changed the way he talked about it god changed the way others talked about it because they are also having to call him abraham because he's gone undergone a name change he probably called them and told them see look my name is not abram anymore you better call me abraham so everybody said father of many nations every time they said mr father of many nations so in a day hundreds of time he mentioned that name father of many nations others mentioned that name 
he was continually hearing god did this not because naemiology like i said god did this because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so that he may continually hear himself called by that name the father of many nation and by faith coming in he may become the father of many nation god gave that name to him and uh, what did it do what did it do to abraham in romans 4 you read about that in verse 18 paul talks about it he said this worked so well that while he had no hope against all hope he believed in hope that god will give him the child that's the way paul puts it while there is no hope while the world said the doctor said all the friends said everybody said the community said like i said the whole town was just abraham's people Everybody said it's not going to happen, forget it. Everybody said, no, it's not possible. But God says it's possible. And while he was speaking God's word and God's promise through that name. See, God was teaching him how to speak the promises. How to get that guy in the old times to speak the promises? There was no AFT church to come and hear about confession and faith and all this business, you know. How to teach this guy to confess and keep on saying so that faith will come, so that whatever he's hoping for will come. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith must come, the substance must come, so that the things hoped for will come. He's hoping for a son. How will that come? Faith must come. How will faith come? By hearing. By hearing the word of God. How will he hear the word of God? He didn't even have a church to go and hear the word of God. He must hear it right where he is. Every day he must hear it. All the time he must hear it. Because it comes not because he heard it. It comes because he hears it. He keeps on hearing it. How to do it? God said name change. This will make him hear it all the time. And uh, Abraham took it up. He made a decision, I suppose. He said, look, he didn't have to see, I know he made a decision because if I was him, I'd have said, look, God, too late to change my name. My father and mother should have named me like that when I was born. Otherwise, when I got to know you, when you came and called me from the land where I was to come and follow you, you should have changed my name. Now, so many years later, I'm 99 and my wife look at her 90. And you're changing my name as father of many nations. Doesn't it look like mockery? I'm not going to take this name because everybody's going to laugh when I tell my name. So leave me alone. Don't change my name. That's what I would have probably said. But Abraham made a decision. What decision? He's, he made a decision that every one of us today have to make. My situation is like this, but God says this is what he wants for me. My problem is this, but God says this is what he wants for me. This is what God is prom promising. Am I going to embrace the problem or am I going to embrace God's answer for my problem? Am I going to embrace this hope that God is feeding me or faith that God is feeding me? Or am I going to embrace this difficulty that I'm facing and this unhappiness that I'm having? I'm having this. See, all of us, you know, face one way or the other some challenge or some difficulty or something. And always, every day, you have a choice between what God says about your situation in your spirit, soul, and body, family, finances, in the work of your hands, in every way. In all the problems of your life, you have a choice, you have an option. Option to go with what God says or option to go with what you feel like or what you feel comfortable with. Are you going to go on with this problem or are you going to choose God's word? If you have an option to change it, if, you, if somebody tells you, you don't have to be like this, you can change it. It can change. This can be changed because God promises this. God said he will do like this. You are a child of God. You are in a covenant. Therefore, you shouldn't be like that. If somebody put it like that to me, I would want to change. If there is a possibility, then why should I live in failure? If there is a possibility for a better life, then why should I have this life? I will have that better life. I will go for it. Then I have to know how to go from here to there. How to go from this unsolved difficulty and challenge to a solution and an answer to my problem. Then I have to make a decision. I have to, I'm, uh, if that's the only way to go to it is to take the promises of God and put it in my mouth so that it will get into my heart, so that that will produce faith, so that I can win the battles of my life. If this is how my answer is going to come, then what I will do is, I will quickly make a quality decision in my life.
See, everybody needs to make a quality decision every now and then. Quality decisions make our quality of our life better. Our God is good, our God is great, our God is true. There is nothing in this world he cannot do. His mighty hands were made available to you. Oh, praise his name, he's on the other side of faith. Our God is good, our God is great, our God is true. There is nothing in this world he cannot do. His mighty hands were made available to you. Oh, praise his name, he's on the other side of faith. Keep pressing on, keep pressing on. side of faith and though the clouds may fall a moment remember God is on the other side of faith keep pressing on keep pressing on God's on the other side of Remember, God is on the other side of faith. Threatening clouds may hide your vision for a while. And you may wonder if he hears you when you pray. But don't forget that God is love and you're his child. On in faith because the answer's on the way. Keep pressing on, keep pressing on. God's on the other side of faith, and though the clouds may for a moment hide his face. 